might be able to discern the truth of the precious word, apply it to our life, let it come into our heart, and change us into what you would have us to be. I pray for the pastor, pray you touch him, anoint him, pray you strengthen him, I pray you give him liberty to be able to stand and preach today. In order for all that's accomplished, go bow our most unworthy heads and we'll give you the praise for it. For it's in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right, so we uh, left off last week in Romans 5.18. Now, as you know, as <clears throat> when the Bible was written, and uh, they didn't have chapter and verse markings, and so um, we're going to be seeing a transition from chapter 5 going into chapter 6, and there's a setup here, and Paul's laying out the argument here. And so we're going to kind of see that as we transfer over into, into Romans chapter 6, which... Um, Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8 for the Christian is probably the three most important chapters in the New Testament or maybe in all the Bible because it's going to give you some practical things about uh, the old man and the new man and crucifying the flesh and that there's no good thing in that flesh. And then you get over into Romans chapter 8 and, we, and he starts talking about eternal security of the believer and so that you can be grounded and settled in the truth. So for the Christian, these are so vitally important for you to understand and to get nailed down that it, it is imperative that you that you get that thing nailed down it's going to help you some of the like I've said it before but some of the biggest questions that we get is about eternal security and not understanding the old man and the new man <clears throat> okay and so that's why we're gonna we keep hammering those things because it's so vitally important because it's not being taught nor preached anymore in a lot of churches and that's why we get a lot of those kind of questions coming to us because for that reason okay so let's look at uh, Romans 5:18. Therefore, as by one man, or what, as by by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Didn't say some men; it said all men. Now God would have all men to be saved, but do they all get saved? No, because you're dealing with free will. The question oftentimes comes up: Well, if God is God, why didn't He just create people that wouldn't sin? Well, that then guess what? That's not real love. Okay, God doesn't create robots. He created everything with a free will, even Lucifer and the angels. They had a choice. They made their choice. You either love God or you love yourself. It's really that simple. Okay, as we get into Romans chapter 6, I call it the cross and the crown chapter. Uh, I just preached last Sunday about that Uzziah who's sitting upon that, the old king, the old man who's sitting upon that throne. Okay, and depending on who's sitting on that throne depends on who wins. Okay, your old man or the new man. Okay, so we'll see that here, but he says by one man. So when Adam sinned, his sin and that death passed upon all men. We had no choice in the matter. So Christ comes, and now we have a choice. Okay, we can either receive Christ or we can reject him. If you reject him, you go to hell. That's what the Bible says. There's no, there's no gray area with the Lord. It's either you're with him or you're against him. Amen. And so that's, there's not, that's not preached enough today. There's, no, there's only one way to heaven. It's through Jesus Christ, His Son, through the blood. Okay, and we all understand that. We've been through that many times. But He says, Upon all men under justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Let's go to Philippians. Let's look at the obedience. Philippians chapter 2. Very familiar passage. Philippians uh, 2 6, <clears throat> who being in the form of God, thought it not ro robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto, the de unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. So we see that God's Jesus Christ, his obedience was the reason the sacrifice meant anything in the first place. Now, once again, I'll go back to what I preached on Sundays, talking about to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken better than the fat of rams. If King Saul had obeyed, there would have been no need for the sacrifice. Had Adam and Eve obeyed, there'd been no need for the lambskin. Okay? To obey is better. Okay? Yes, we have the sacrifice and thank God for it, but we have to understand that somebody had to pay the price so that we could go free. 
So when you go out there and you just you just sin, 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 and you have no, there's no sort of chastening, you might want to check up. Because when, before I was saved, I could do what I wanted to do. Why? Because I was, I was unsaved. I was living just like a dog. But when I got saved, and that's the, the, a lot of times people, I don't know if I'm saved. Well, okay, I'll give you some sort of assurance. How do you look at sin? How does it affect you? Because if you remember when you were a lost man, it didn't have the same effect as it does after you're saved. When that, when that Holy Ghost chastens you, that's a little different. So your, your outlook on how you look at sins and how, how that affects your inner man has an effect on you. If you want to know you're saved, look at that. How do you look at sin? Okay, you just look at it flippantly like, ah, whatever. Or does it hurt you? Does it bother you? That's a good indication that you're probably saved. A lost man don't care about that. <clears throat> okay? All right, but we see his obedience. So because of one man's disobedience, that'd be Adam, death passed upon all men. But because of one man's obedience, that'd be Jesus Christ, we get the gift of righteousness. Okay? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's look at the comparison. Verse 45. Look at here. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. Notice that. Notice the first man. Can you hear me? Okay. The first man is carnal. That's Adam. The second man, the second man Adam, spiritual, which is Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, when you're going through the Old Testament, you'll see a lot of pairs, right? You'll see it show up. Um, you'll see that, uh, what do you have? You have Cain and Abel. All right, who was first born? Cain. He was of that wicked one. He slew his brother Abel. You see the first birth? Natural. These are types. You see the second birth? Spiritual. Okay? Uh, let's, let's look at some others. Uh, let's go. You got Ishmael. You got Isaac. Who's the firstborn? Ishmael. Who's the secondborn? Isaac. Right? Type of the new birth. Let's look at Galatians chapter 4. Look at Galatians chapter 4. Now, if you're a natural man reading the Bible in the Old Testament, a lot of these things are not going to stick out to you. Why? Because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, or foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. Look at look what Paul says over here. Look at uh, Galatians 4.28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, see the simile, the similitude, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. See, Isaac is a type, spiritual man. Okay? Ishmael is a type of the flesh. Okay? You notice that uh, Abraham, in Genesis 22, he was to take his only begotten son up to the... Well, that, was that his only son? No, but, not, but the way that God looked at it, Isaac was his only son. This man's crucified. He's dead, as we'll get into Romans chapter 6. Okay? Let's look at some others. Now, this is the way it's usually mentioned. It's usually mentioned Jacob and Esau, but we know he was the firstborn, Esau. He's of the earth. He's ruddy. Second man is Jacob. Now, Jacob had his problems, didn't he? All right? What does his name become? Israel. Prince with God. There's the new birth. He wrestles with God at Peniel, Genesis 32. See the types? Okay, so what's God honoring? The second birth. Not the first birth. First man, Adam, is carnal. Goes back to the ground. Second man, Adam, spiritual, Jesus Christ. 
Okay, so when you're reading Genesis, the book of beginnings, you see those types, and the, the Bible sets it up for you. That's where I don't understand why, why he's always given the, the, the inheritance to the second child, Ephraim and Manasseh. Who was the who was the older child? Manasseh. Who'd the inheritance get to go to? Ephraim, second birth. And we'll see here in a minute, we'll talk about Joseph, okay? All right. So all those types in the Old Testament are there to teach you something, some spiritual things, give you that understanding of the new birth. Okay? Not that they were born again in the Old Testament, you understand that those are types. Okay? Let's go back to Romans chapter 6 or 5. <clears throat> so by the obedience of one sh shall many be made righteous. Many. Who's the many? As many as receive him. That's the key. Okay? We're not dealing with election. Some predetermined to be saved and some predetermined to be lost. No. As many as receive him. Look at verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Okay? So the law entered is to be our schoolmaster, to point us to Christ. Okay? We understand in uh, Hebrews chapter 10 that that law could never make the comers there into perfect. Yes, they, their sins could be forgiven, but not taken away. Okay? Until Jesus Christ shows up, the, righteous, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, that conscience could not be cleared. Okay? And so, but that law entered because of, because of transgression, as he says in Galatians. But look back over here in Jeremiah, chapter 7, verse 22. Jeremiah, chapter 7. So you don't get this in Exodus, you get this in Jeremiah. He's looking back and he's telling a story, something you didn't know. Look over here, uh, look at verse 21, Jeremiah 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, put your burnt offerings unto your sacrifices and eat flesh. Now this is, they're transgressing, they're just doing things mechanically, they're doing things religiously, they're doing things to be seen, and God knows the matter is with their heart. They're not doing it because they love the Lord, they're doing it to be seen of men. So they're just going through the motions. Okay? For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this thing... Commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. See that? He didn't give them the Levitical sacrifices and all that when they were in Egypt. They had to get out of Egypt. The blood is what got them out of Egypt. Okay? It was the blood of the Lamb. Okay? That's a type of our salvation. So when they got out and they crossed the Red Sea and, and all the, the things that they did, and they went down to Sinai, and because of transgression, they were given the law. Okay, and they agreed to a contract. Uh, I'm not going to get into all that because it'll take us off on a rabbit trail. But they agreed to that contract, but that, that law was given because of transgression. I mean, think about it. In, in uh, Exodus 32, Moses went up to receive the law. What did the, what the children of Israel do? What did they do immediately? Made a golden calf. <laughs> There's their idol. It was all about themselves. Okay? So that just shows, shows right there the, how quickly we turn out of the way. Without the Holy Spirit guiding us, we'd be in a mess. Okay? Our flesh would just take over and you'd do whatever it wanted to do. It'd just be like if you had a kid, if you didn't, if you didn't wash them and tell them what to eat, they'd sit there and eat ice cream and, and uh, you know, Lucky Charms all day. And not even, not even the brown part, just the, just the, the marshmallows. Amen? I got a four-year-old, so you know where that illustration is coming from. You know, so that's what the flesh wants. It wants to satisfy itself, and that's exactly what they did. But because, uh, go back to Romans chapter 5, more, more of the law entered that the, the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Okay, so we see in the Old Testament, we've got a lot of great types of that. Um, we talked about that last night, David and Bathsheba. Okay, and, and God gave him grace, didn't he? See where the sin abounded? What did the sin, what did the sin that David... What did he do? What did it? What uh, penalty was required from the law? Death. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. You've you've heard that God's grace is greater than our sin. Okay, it can cover a multitude all sin. Okay, because it's God's blood that was shed on the cross. Therefore, anybody can be saved. Anybody can be born again. 
just by receiving him. So it doesn't matter what a person did. It's already been paid for. Okay, he's the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Okay, look at um, verse 21, that as, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, we're going to look at some verses here. Like I said, the next chapter we get into the cross and the crown. It's all about rule, dominion, reigning. Who's in charge? Okay, Romans chapter 6, who's in charge? Okay, let's look at the first one, rule. Look at Genesis 1.16. First time that shows up. Sets the standard. Genesis 1.16. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So that's the first time that that word rule shows up in your Bible. Notice he's talking about the sun and the moon. <clears throat> okay, so to rule is to have the preeminence. Because in the daytime, the sun has the preeminence. In the nighttime, the moon has the preeminence. Okay, but who's greater, the sun or the moon? Well, the sun is. What's the sun a type of? Jesus Christ, the Son of Righteousness, S-U-N, that's Malachi 4.2. So we can see the type, all right, and ruling in Jesus Christ is to have the preeminence. That's Colossians chapter 1. I think it's verse 16 or 18. I can't remember. But anyway, he's to have the preeminence. So you see the ruling. Who has the preeminence in your life? You have to ask that question to yourself. Okay, I dare say that most folks, and you're coming to Sunday school, you're, you're on a pretty good track. All right, let's look at uh, dominion, Genesis 1.26. Notice how many, all these things are shown up in Genesis. Genesis 1.26, and God said, let us make man in our image. Who's the image of God? Jesus Christ. After our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and ev over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So we, we talked about that last time, how Adam was given dominion. He was that king over the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. He lost his dominion. He lost his crown. Who's the God of this world now? Satan. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. But you'll notice Adam's sin passed upon all creation. Look at Noah's flood. What got caught up in Noah's flood? Everything here that he was given dominion over suffered because of Adam's sin. So when you sin, somebody else is going to suffer. No man liveth and dieth unto himself. Everything that we do has a consequence. It's like dropping a rock in a, in a lake. And those ripples go out. There's a ripple effect when we sin. It doesn't just affect us. Remember Achan, Joshua chapter 7? When he sinned, did it just affect Achan? Nope. It affected his whole family. And his whole family didn't even know that Achan did that. Maybe the wife did. She probably did. She usually does. You know, I won't tell anybody else but my wife. And then she tells. Anyway. <laughs> not that my wife does that. I'm, not, I'm just saying. You know, that's how it works. Okay, but anyway, let's get back to dominion. All right, so he was given dominion. That's the first time it shows up. So it's about ruling. Who's in charge? Who's the king? All right, now let's look at reign. Look at Genesis 37. Look at these things, how they tie in together. Look at Genesis 37, verse 8. First time that reign ever shows up. 37, 8, this is Joseph. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him, yet... Yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Now, who, who does that sound like in the New Testament? Jesus Christ. His brethren hated him. Why? They didn't want him to rule over them. They didn't want Jesus Christ to reign over them. You know what your old man hates? Jesus Christ. He doesn't want him to rule and reign over your flesh. The old man wants to be in charge. See how that lines up perfectly? Same thing we're talking about in the New Testament. Okay? So you can see there, ruling, dominion, reign, who's in charge? You know why they hate the King James Bible? Authority. Authorized version. And who, who passed it down? Who said it's going to be an authorized version? A king. King James. And they hate him. And they'll attack his character and all this kind of nonsense all the time. All right? Where the word of a king is, there's power. Just depends on who's in charge. Remember in the book of Judges? What did it say in the last verse in the book of Judges? It says uh, that men will do what's right in their own eyes when there's no king in the land. There was no king. They never checked with the word of God. They did whatever they wanted to do. They never checked. So who was, who was ruling and reigning? A bunch of men doing what they thought was right. Preaching their own convictions instead of sticking with the book. 
where you get into trouble as a preacher, you start preaching your convictions versus what the Bible says. Amen? I'm telling you, it'll, it'll, this thing will keep you straight. It'll keep you within the guidelines. You don't go out here and veer off to the right or veer off to the left. You stay within the book and you'll, stay, and you'll be fine. The problem is we want to do it our way. Amen? Okay. Now, I think we read verse 21. Yes. We're talking about reigning. Okay, so we understand. So it sets it up for chapter 6, the cross and the crown. All right, so verse six, chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that, that grace may abound? Now, he's going, up from, uh, he's going on from verse 20. Where, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So, so there were some people out there that were slandering Paul, saying that what he was teaching was that, oh, you just go ahead and sin like you want to because grace is greater than your sin, and that's antinomianism. That's, against, that's no law, okay? And that's what a lot of folks get into. Uh, in today, well, all my sins were judged at the cross, therefore I can do what I want. God didn't save you so you could run his name through the mud. Amen? You're a Christian, or you're a saved sinner, but you may not be a Christian. A Christian is a disciple, technically. If you want to get technical about it, that's Acts 11.26. Little Christs, okay, light bearers, okay? That's what Christopher means, okay? And so, <clears throat> so when people, any, anything goes today, somebody says, oh, I'm a Christian. What does that mean? Nothing. In, in today's society, that means, means absolutely nothing, okay? Because they don't even understand what a Christian is. It's just a disciple of Christ, okay? What's the root word of disciple? Discipline. Got to be disciplined, right? Those first disciples, you think they were disciplined? You better believe they were. And if they, if they got out of line, old Peter would come down there and smack them. Oh, you lie to the Holy Ghost? Dead. Dropped them dead on the spot. Imagine that today. People, people all the time, oh, we need to get back to the book of Acts and how it was in the first church. You sure about that? You sure about that? You, you want Peter coming in here and, and you, you lie to the Holy Ghost about some land you sold and says, bam, you're dead. Bring your wife in here and says, oh, go ahead, I'll give you a chance to answer. Ah, oh, you lied. Bam, you're dead. That's how they dealt with the kingdom of, uh, kingdom of God is not in word but in power. They didn't mess around in the first church. They set the standard, didn't they? Just because we've fallen off doesn't mean that they did. Oh boy, they got power. All right, so get back in the text here. So he's not saying that you just go out there and live how you want to. Okay, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Okay, that's Romans 8, 13. All right, look at verse 2. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer there? And here's a doctrinal thing. All right. Who's ever heard that such and such is living in sin? Of course, everybody has, right? Well, we understand what somebody's saying when they're saying that. Okay, they're living. A Christian technically cannot live in sin. Why? Because he's in Christ. His old man's crucified. However, he can sin. Who's who's doing the sinning? The old man. He's on the he's on the crown. He's on the throne. Okay. If any man said he had no sin, he'd make, make God a liar, okay? You're, you're, you're lying to yourself if you say that you have no sin, okay? That's the old man, all right? But technically, doctrinally, this is your position. This is your standing. It's in Christ. However, you can sin. That's the works of the flesh, which are manifest, which are these. And he gives that list, okay? So understand, this is the new man. No. New man. And this is the old man. He was not saved. He was crucified. If you yield to the Holy Spirit, you'll keep him crucified. But if you continue to feed him, he'll raise up his ugly head, and he'll take over, and he'll get on the, he'll get on the crown, and you'll put Christ back on the cross. Amen? All right? So that's, that's important to understand that, because that trips a lot of people up. That's what he's dealing with here. Who's ever heard of Romans 6.23? For the wages of sin is death. Right? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What is that found in? What do we use that in soul winning? Romans Road. Right? Technically, doctrinally, Paul's talking to who here? Christians. Okay? So don't forget the context of Romans chapter 6. All right? Let's continue to um, read here. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us, were, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. 
Okay? You're baptized into Jesus Christ. By what? People might look at that verse and say, oh, that's, that's, that's water baptism. Okay? I'm talking about this baptism. Did you say anything about water there? Okay, go to Acts 1.5. First Corinthians twelve thirteen, Acts one five. Acts one five for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Who's doing the baptizing? Holy Ghost is. What is the Holy Ghost doing? Putting you into the body of Christ. Okay? When you get saved. Now notice what he left off in that passage. Fire. That's right. Somebody's been reading their Bible. Matthew chapter 3, and that's verse 12. John the Baptist says, Holy Ghost and fire. What's the fire? That's the second advent. He's talking about now. He's talking about the first advent. Remember that? Know that. Okay? Go to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Always compare Scripture with Scripture. Let the Bible define itself. 1 Corinthians 12, <clears throat> verse 13. For by one Spirit, capital S, are we all baptized into one body. There's not two bodies, one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. And that spiritual rock, that rock was Christ. Okay, 1 Corinthians 10, 4, I believe it is. Okay, that rock that was in the wilderness, that was Christ. Amen? What was, what was Moses to do the first time? Smote it. What was he to do to the second time? Speak to it. God smote him first time. You're to speak to him the second time. Okay? Amen? All right, so we understand from comparing Scripture, what's he talking about this baptism? All right? That is the spiritual baptism that Jesus Christ, you get put into the body by the Holy Spirit. You're sanctified by the Spirit. Okay? So the church is a spiritual body made up of individual believers. Okay? Amen? All right, let's continue on. Uh, Romans 6, 4, Therefore we are buried with Him in, by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. See the should, but do we always? No. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2. That's like I preached last Sunday. Your biggest problem is your flesh. The only thing that you can control is what you do with that. You can either crucify it or you can feed it. Everything else going on around you, you cannot control, but you can control your fellowship. And many times, we, we're the ones who get out of fellowship. We're the ones who leave Jesus Christ at the temple. He didn't go anywhere. We left. Amen. All right, look at uh, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, present tense. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. There's the new creature. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So I'm crucified, present tense, with Christ. But when was the crucifixion? 2,000 years ago. But because he lives, see the present tense? You're living also, but you're living out Jesus Christ, His life, not your own. Where's your, where's, your, where's your life at? Your physical life. How God looks at it is crucified, dead and buried in the ground. He doesn't, he doesn't even give it any credit. It just When it does things, God didn't even... That's just a dead man. When you get up to the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to see how many things that you did that were counted as nothing because God just looked at it as a dead man taking care of Himself. Amen? Okay. Go back to Romans chapter 6. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. All right, let's go to John 12. Now, when the Lord's speaking to this in John 12, they have no understanding what He's even saying. John 12, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Notice that. But if it die, 
it bringeth forth much fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, some hundredfold. What's got to die? Self. What comes up? Resurrection. What's the fruit? Fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. See how much, see how much Paul emphasizes the crucifying of the old man? I die daily. It's, one, it's, it's going to be the, one of the hardest things that you do as a Christian is crucifying the old man on a daily basis. Because you can come in here and you can agree with everything I'm saying and walk out that door and somebody cut you off in traffic and there he is. Shows right up, man. You can look all spiritual in here. Get out there, start Christian cussing, you know. Golly bum and all the, all the Christian curse words that you know that you... All the things that you learned how to say because you've been in church for a while. Mm -hmm. When really you know the expletives that are really coming out of your mind. <laughs> you know, especially if you came from where I came from. And that was our second language. All right. So that's everything you can do. Just shut up, you know. All right, let's get back to Romans 6. See how practical this stuff is? This, this is coming from a man who was saved for 27 years. and the greatest Christian ever lived. And he's the one telling you these things. So if Paul struggled with it, you better believe you're going to struggle with it. Amen? All right, look at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, but we do. Because in us dwelleth no good thing in our flesh. Oftentimes we give over to that thing instead of to the Spirit. Look at verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. He's freed from it. There's a jailbreak that took place. You're cut loose from the inside. You're free to move about the cabin. Okay? But a lot of times you put yourself back in bondage by what? Sin. You get yourself right back in that same prison. You put yourself in there and, and you're in the, in the doghouse. Okay? You quench the spirit. How can I say that? How can I know that? Because I've done it. And you've done it. Okay? Look at verse 8. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Life that I now live, that's what he's talking about in Galatians 2. See how these things go together? Verse, verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. There's that dominion. It doesn't rule and reign. Okay, he's defeated death at the cross. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. He ever liveth, as it says in Hebrews 7.25, to make intercession for us. Because he lives, we live. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reckon it. Count it. When sin creeps up, you've got to get it under the blood. You've got to, you've got to count yourself as dead. When, you, find that old, when you, you feel that old man rising up, you've got to kill him. Because he's going to destroy your testimony. He's going to do something that God doesn't want you to do. He wants good things for you. But if you don't kill Uzziah, he's going to do what he wants to do. Amen? Let's keep reading like right here. Verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Let's flip this over. <clears throat> Went through Genesis 37, 8. Let's go to Colossians 3, 5. Let's try to tie a bow on this thing. Colossians 3, 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Well, Americans have a hard time with that one. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Notice that. The reason that the wrath of God is coming on the children of disobedience is because of those things. Everything he mentioned there is a work of the flesh. Amen? In which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. See, see that? You used to live in those things, but now you're in Christ. But you can still do those things. Okay? But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You're a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Created after the image of Christ. Okay, take that to heart. Now, so you're to mortify your members. Let's go back over here to Job. We have a hard time with that, don't we? 
What do you remember? Is there anything that hangs off of your body? That's what, that's what gets you into trouble. Go to Job 11. Job chapter 11, verse 14. Try to get through these things quickly. But not 14. Look at uh, Job 11, 11. For he knoweth vain man. He, he seeth wickedness also. Will he not then consider it? For vain man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's colt. He's a rebel, isn't he? He doesn't want to do what God tells him to do. He's like, he's like a wild ass, like, like a donkey. If thou prepare thine heart, here's the key, and stretch out thine hands toward him, if iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away, and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. Okay? When that thing comes in, you better crucify it, or it's going to take, it's going to take over. Don't let it sit there and dwell in your tabernacles. Okay? Continue reading. For then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot, Yea, thou shalt be steadfast, and shalt not fear. See, the fear goes away. Perfect love casteth out fear. All right? Because thou shalt forget thy misery, and remember it as waters that pass away. When you're under conviction because you've done something, you're miserable as a Christian. Amen? And thine age shall be clearer than the noonday. Thou shalt shine forth, thou shalt be as the morning. Well, what's that a type of? That's a, the morning. Clear as the morning. Bright as an army. Is, that's like the sun, Right? And thou shalt be secure. All right, you want to be secure in your, in your salvation? You want, to be, you want to have peace with God? Take that thing that's dwelling in your tabernacles and kill it. And you're going to have peace with God. All right? For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. All right? And thou shalt be secure because there is hope. See the hope? Hope maketh not ashamed. All right? Yea, thou shalt dig about thee, and thou shalt take, thee, take thy rest in safety. Also shalt, thou shalt lie down, and none shall make thee afraid, or Psalm 23. Yea, many shall make, uh, make suit unto thee, but the eyes of the wicked shall fail, and they shall not escape, and their hope shall be as the giving up of, of the ghosts, as wicked men. But if you don't want to be like them, you don't want to be under the condemnation as far as physically, you better put that sin away from you. Let's look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Verse 133, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Purifying your hearts by faith. The washing of the water of the word. You want to keep the sin down? Read your Bible. Pray over it. It will purify you. Amen? And because of that, you won't, sin won't have dominion over you. Look at Psalm uh, 1913. Psalm 1913, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. See the dominion? Those presumptuous sins, you're presuming something that's not even true. That's the fiery darts of the wicked. Satan loves to use those against you. Put things in your head that aren't true, and you start thinking things like King Saul. He thought that David was out to get him, and he wasn't. And what happened? Wrath, that wrath came up, didn't it? He wanted to pin David to the wall. D David was innocent. That's a presumptuous sin. It'll have dominion over you. It'll rule and reign over you if you let it. Okay? Look at uh, Colossians. Now let's go to Colossians 3. Look at verse 15. He just talked about putting off the old man, putting on the new. Colossians 3.15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, and, ye shall, and, and be ye thankful. Okay, how are you going to let that peace rule in your heart? When that sin comes, you better kill it. You better crucify the old man before it manifests itself in other ways. And then you'll be sorry. How many murderers, how many killers, how many thieves, how many, all those things wish that they could go back and do that and just have a do-over. Well, how many times have you done that in your Christian life? Because you failed to, pr to prepare correctly. You failed to pray up, just like in the garden. Okay, and they weren't ready when the temptation came. They weren't prepared for it. And when it came, it reared his, his ugly head, and there you are weeping like Peter because you failed the Lord once again because you weren't prepared for it. Okay, you got lazy. You got slack. You didn't want to get in the book. You left Jesus Christ in the temple for one day, and you're out of fellowship. And then something comes along in your life, and you do something out of character, 
and you wish you could go back and redo it. How do we prevent that? Commit thy works on the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. Get in the book. Pray over it. Crucify the old man. Amen. And peace of God will rule in your heart. One last verse. Look at Psalm 119, 165. I'm getting there, eventually. Psalm 119, 165. Look at this. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Nothing shall offend them. All right? You're not easily provoked, as it says in 1 Corinthians 13. You can take anything if you're in fellowship with Jesus Christ. They railed on him. He didn't say anything back to them. He didn't have a problem, did he? We're the ones with the problem. Because when that pride wells up, boy, you want to defend yourself, that flesh, man, it really wants to, I'll show you something. There's that wrath. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. I mean, this book just cuts you left and right. So, the cross and the crown. Who's on the cross and who's on the crown? All right, let's end there. Father, Lord God, we just thank you, Lord, for this time once again. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the study of it. And we just thank you for guiding us in the Scripture, giving us uh, something to edify us, Lord. And I just pray for those today that are in this house today. I just pray that they take it home with them and think on it. And it's not my word, it's yours. So we know it's true and just. And Father, just pray for the service. Pray for Brother Barry as he leads the choir. Pray for all those in attendance in the choir, Lord. Just be with them, Lord. And, and uh, fill, fill them with your spirit, Lord. And just pray for a pastor. Fill them one more time and give us the bread of life that we need. Lord Jesus' name we pray. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen.